anyway. <laughs> no title. We're going naked. As soon as this goes up, it'll hit Rusty Chats, and then Julie will take it from there. Can I close out of uh, Facebook? I'm out of Facebook. Back in Zoom. We're live. Some already. We're already live. Jules is gonna. She's gonna put us on the other stuff and give us a thumbs up. Good to see you. Good to be seen. Better than the uh, alternative, right? Yeah. Still keep it on the green side of the grass. There we go. Right there, full screen. I've got my uh, Jules is my technical director. I was she's the producer. The, yeah, she's the. <laughs> she is. Um, She's she she does it for uh, not so much money right now. The mortgage payment, I think, is what she's worried about. Hey, roof for roof. So as soon as she tells me we're live on me, so we're live on me. All right, man. So hey, uh, Rob, man, I appreciate you coming and hanging out and drinks with an entrepreneur. Happy Everybody to be. out there today watching, we have Dr. Robert Phillips. I'm not going to call him Doctor anymore after this because he's too cool for that. What you drinking, man? This is a rye old fashioned. Rye old fashioned. Is that not what we had last time we were up there in Asheville? Almost certainly. If you were with me, that's probably what you had. So I've been doing this um, scout and cellar stuff. This is a scout and cellar wine. Okay. Yeah. I don't even know how to pronounce it. So it is a, a field house white wine blend from Mondesino county california is that one you lived out there is that what you know that world yeah that's up in uh, that's up in north yeah so uh, i don't i don't know as much about wine. perhaps i should california's a big place it it, it in a small uh it in a small city it's bigger than quite a few countries right oh you're from california did you know frank <laughs> how many times have, I can't tell you how many times when I hear I, I went to Appalachian State, they're like, so did you know such and such? And I'm like, you know, it's really not that small of a school. <laughs> and it was 30 years ago. I don't know I've done the math, but uh, it's been a minute. It's been a minute. So we started at 18. I'm 50, getting ready to turn 51. You're a solid, what, 68? <laughs> uh, that's just my knees. <laughs> I call it a... Uh, I had leg day this week, and as I was trying to get up, it hurt, and then everything started snapping and popping like a 78-year-old man trying to get out of a damn recliner, you know. Jump, pop, 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 pop. You know, you're like, shit, got to yeah. go get knee surgery. Doing so, bench presses in one of those chairs that raises you. That's when you – My granddad had one of them. You remember Popsy? He had one oh, of those yeah. things. Everybody's granddad had one. We, I don't. I don't think we had anyone of us want to go there. Where are you at right now? You up in Asheville? I am in Chapel Hill. Oh, you're in Chapel Hill. All right, right on, right on. So, uh, those of you who don't know, Rob and I have been friends since 1987. I looked at your, um, I looked at all your academia. I looked at um, all your accolades, and and I'm wondering which was the uh, probably the the biggest accomplishment you've ever had, and Personally, I think it's being friends with me since 1987. That's had to have been hard. I didn't know that that was part of my professional CV, though. Yeah, I've always considered that more of a person. Yeah, but I mean, you know, without it, uh, you probably wouldn't have persevered through all the shit you had to persevere through. That is true. You did teach me a lot of and, and, and grinding through adversity. Oh, we grinded through. Remember when we were, uh, you were playing um, intramural basketball and I had the whole fucking uh, uh, walk on football team ready to kick my ass because they were cheating and I called them out. <laughs> I still haven't figured out, I, I actually figured out why people don't like. So, so here's the thing, you, you know, resting bitch face, right? Yeah. <laughs> here's what I look when I'm just unplussed, where I just don't care, and, and, and so I'm sort of indifferent about what's going on, it looks like this. Yeah, that's resting. And apparently, that looks hot. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what to do with that, right? What am I supposed to do? I just sort of, you know. 
that's that's me caring one way or the other and apparently that i hate them when i look at them that way yeah um, that day had nothing to do with you he was cheating and uh i figured that's what it was they were you were up four you scored you scored your team scored again they uh and all of a sudden it was tied and i found out he was kissing the girl over there keeping score and called him out and it was a damn all shit broke loose. And next thing I know for six months, the whole team wanted to beat my ass. <laughs> and, and, and I've noticed that, so I, I wondered why there was so much aggression and hostility in college intramurals until I joined softball. And, and I realized that essentially that was sort of, that's intramural plus, that's graduate level because it was, I've never seen so much cursing and fighting as I have in church league softball. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's because these are people that couldn't make it wherever else. So they're going to make damn well sure they're professional at that. I that <laughs> must be something because, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty competitive, but, uh, but, but I haven't fought over, over a pick up sort of rec game in a while. Yeah, yeah. Probably to you, really, I'd say. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> we were, uh, I think you and I were, I think we were heading out of town or something, but remember we were pulling in and somebody was in the way and I was trying to get around him in the El Camino and you were beside me. And as I was pulling around him, I looked over and was like, this ain't no damn parking space, you know? And all of a sudden, I think his name was Bobby Ross, the, the six foot eight humongous cut like a Greek god, power forward from App State, looked over and he said, what did he say? He goes, motherfucker, I ain't asked you what it was, you know? So I, and, we, and I just rode by <laughs> and you were like, what did he say? And I was like, I, didn't, I don't know. Did he uh, say he, something? He said, hey man, looking good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're right, it wasn't, it wasn't the parking space, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, apparently I was wrong, that's on me. So at App State, man, you were, um, you know, when you went up to App State, were you straight out going to be a business major the whole time? Oh, good question. Um, I guess it was always this uh, this tension in my interest between practicality and uh, and sort of philosophical deep dives into things. And so <clears throat> I wasn't wealthy enough to be a philosophy major, right? So, you know, I'm hoping to get a job at the end of that thing. And so it was always sort of philosophy. Uh, to for the interesting parts and business, so I could maybe get a job at the end of that process. Um, although I guess one of the most interesting things about that was that I, I would try every now and then, where I would try exactly the same thing in class, in a philosophy class, and in a business class. And I knew I was probably on the philosophy class. I was a fascist of some kind. And in the and if I said exactly the same thing in the business classes. I was some sort of weird communist pinko something something. So uh, so I knew I must have threaded a needle in there. So you graduate from app, you take the GMAT. If I recall correctly, you tested in the upper five percentile, right, of the country that particular year. Am I am I wrong? Yeah, or? I'm sure. Yeah, something. Like, I've always been pretty good at the standardized test things. I sucked at him. I usually fell asleep. Um, <laughs> if you could keep my attention, I, I looked intelligent. If you made me sit and answer a bunch of fucking questions, I, I, I was I was a dumbass. You know, so it's like mine is Candy constantly. Crush meets SAT. Then you're on. <laughs> yeah, got yeah. it. The uh, so then you uh, and and you recorded. I think you know if I'm again we're going back years. The Ivy League schools were after you, right? I mean, you know, they all kind of, you know, when you're up that tall, it's sort of like, you know, they're at least, you know, talking to you. Um, I, I honestly don't remember. And I, I mean when I say I don't remember that. But um, but I think that uh, I want to say that Yale waitlisted me. Um, right. but, but, you know, in retrospect, it was a pipe dream anyway, because I couldn't pay that bill. So, you know, it, uh, a lot of what that comes down to for a lot of people, honestly, is, uh, you know, that, that there are sort of economic tranches that you uh, find yourself in as much as academic. 
So when you say that, it, it basically it's not a scholarship type of situation uh, with the Ivy Leagues or, or do so, no, for, well, so for undergrad at, at most of the Ivies, if you get in, it's then it's sort of need based uh, 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 financial aid. But for, for graduate school, less so. Graduate school is very much a, a cash cow for a lot of those shops. And so uh, um, so I you know, so there was scholars. That's part of why I ended up in South Carolina was because uh, there was I think uh, research assistantships and scholarships, or just basically discounts of various sorts. And to be honest, it was also closer to the Carolinas, and uh, and I've just always felt, you know, I've been a, I've been around, and this is just where I feel most comfortable, I guess. And so uh, so it worked out for me. Met some really good people there. Yeah, man, we had some fun down there. I still keep up with your friends down there, um, out in Colorado and whatnot. And yeah, yeah. went last maybe two summers ago. And hung out with Jim T and the boys, and went to see uh, Tom Petty and whatnot out at uh, Red Rocks. So that was a that was a good time. So I, I, it, I'm glad you introduced me to those cats. Then you went, and then from there you went to UVA. Yeah, how was that? How cool was that? Oh, uh, that was that was uh, extraordinary, really. Um, so in terms of, so you would ask me, you know, the the my the, the accomplishment, and I would say that the the PhD uh, at UVA was probably the one that. Uh, uh, took the most sustained effort to accomplish. So there's just a lot about promotions and getting jobs that is just probabilistic, I find, right? I, I can't tell you how many times I finished second in any number of, you know, job searches and, and just matching procedures in general. Um, yeah, so, uh, so, so that one actually it was my number one choice. Um, and, and I still remember the day that, uh, my advisor, Patricia Werhain called me and told me I had gotten in because we had this tradition back at South Carolina with the guys I was telling you about, uh, they introduced this thing called the Godzilla. And so a, a Godzilla means that, uh, no matter what anybody else is doing, if you call Godzilla, everybody has to stop whatever they're doing and come drinking with you. And, <laughs> right. And you know, we had a lot of stuff going on. I mean, we were sort of busy people at that time and you could only do it like once a year or once a life or something, right? So it, was, it wasn't, a, it was abusable, but we never did. But but I called a Godzilla that morning. So it was maybe 10 a.m. or something like that. And I, I rallied all of my people and-, uh, and we So you uh, you called a Godzilla and everybody came running. And yeah, it was time to go to that party because you were going to EVA. Yeah. Yeah, so that was yeah. a good thing. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I, I tell people, so I watch, um, you know, I, I listen to some NFL players and things like that. And I think it was, was Chris Long and, you know, he graduated from UVA and, and, and he, they talked about, they, they were talking to him one time and he said, man, you're dealing with the leaders of the damn free world at that school, you know? So it, it's pretty much, it's not Ivy league, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's one of the best, you know, if not the best, arguably state sported school in the country, would you, would you say, or, or damn close to it? Um, yeah, no, I don't. So, so the thing I was trying to remember, I'm pretty sure that, yeah, Chris Long is probably 30 ish now with that. So, so yeah. I'm pretty sure that I coached, uh, his little league. I was, uh, uh, he was, he was up against us in little league, uh, when I was coaching my advisor's, uh, son, we were, we were all sort of team coaching. We, um, even as a young kid, I mean, he was probably seven or eight years old and he was this much taller than everybody else in the league. Right. A, even as a, like a seven or eight year old, he was a huge, huge individual. And so, uh, yeah, so it was Howie and, and, and his wife would uh, be coming out to little league games and this kind of thing. And uh, yeah, he uh, he was a specimen from an early age. So did, so Howie lived in Virginia? Still does. Best I can tell. Really? Yeah, he, uh, again, I don't know, all this is kind of, uh, I've never been there, and so this is all kind of the rumor mill stuff, but the, the, the rumor mill has him buying an old elementary school and refurbishing it as his home. Man, Julie wants to do that shit. Yeah, I think they're going to be available. He can probably get a good shopping mall in five or six years. Well, you know, it's funny because she talks about every time we drive by an old school, she goes, it makes me feel bad that they're just sitting there and there's people out there buying these things. And she's looking at me and, and back to your point of not being able to afford to be a philosopher. I'm like, yeah, well, well we can't afford to buy that shit. Buy school, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
So I built her a she shed, which is a <laughs> off the back of my deck, which is basically uh, uh, I'm broadcasting live. I was from say, shed. And then you co-opted it as your studio. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, we we were play uh, we were doing um, live from Facebook and. A friend of mine uh, who's a, a, a network here, he owns a great networking company, not not like a full on networking MSP type company. And he said, uh, he said, I think you need to call this songs from the she shed. And I was like, yeah, I think when I do my next album, I'm going to call it that. You know, so I think that's a cool name. You know, it's not bad. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So. Um, so anyway, so you graduated from there. And I always thought this was really cool. You know, um, your first job was at Georgetown. It was. It was. Yeah. And that's a pretty badass school as well. So that was your first job. You also taught at Penn. I did. So you I did, did teach Ivy League. So instead of instead of you couldn't afford to go to Ivy League, but you got paid by them, right? No, that is true. There was a, a, a um until my until the job I have now, I had never paid tuition to a private school and never gotten a paycheck from a public one. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty fucking cool. Yeah, you know. And so uh, Georgetown, Penn, you know, and then straight out to University of San Diego. San Diego. And got tenure in five? Yeah, that's, that's, that gets tedious. The story of my tenure path is, uh, is long and tedious and probably not worth sharing outside of people who, know what it means to like give up tenure so there was a, a a time where i i had a job for life in san diego where i couldn't be fired and i decided that that was too easy and so i uh threw that overboard and, and started over i remember you calling me and um you 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 called me up and you said um man i'm thinking about coming back east and you said uh you said there's nothing out here to hate but there's really nothing to love, you know, I, it, it's fantastic, but I don't love it because I'm not from here. And, um, you said, but you know, what do you, you know, you were, it, it was pretty cool because you called me. I was like, what the fuck are you calling me about? I don't, you know, but I guess I'm somebody to bounce shit off of, but I was like, you know, you said, so I'm leaving tenure and which is, you know, that, that golden glove that you never, you know, having that means something. Right. And I remember saying to you, I was like, well, I guess I would say welcome to the fucking real world, you know, because if you're good at what you do and you're a badass, they're not going to let you go anyway, you know. And so, hell, it's a challenge. And if you're good and you are, so you come over to U of R, University of Richmond, and it was on a non-tenured track, if I recall. And, um, and I'm going through all this shit. I don't think anybody knows. I'm not reading a damn thing. This was not <laughs> sent to me in an email. I have done all I could do to burn fucking brain cells and they just, they keep multiplying or something. Yeah, you're, you're wasting them on that, man. Yeah. <laughs> and so you uh, came to U of R and which ultimately turned into a professorship and tenure yes. out of nowhere, right? No, it wasn't out of nowhere. No, this was, it, it, it was but I mean, it wasn't there. the path to begin with. Yeah, it was. That, that was oh, always, was? Okay. Yeah, 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 that was always, uh, I mean, Tenure is a, is an asymmetric contract, right? I can quit any time, but they can't fire me. So who wouldn't want that? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it was always, but, but it was never, uh, it was never, a, a, the, I always felt like if you did what you're supposed to do, that generally speaking, the, uh, the rewards come and that's not always true, but, uh, but What's, what else are you going to do, right? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I think that if you start trying to uh, manage to the metric, uh, that it actually makes you weaker rather than just doing the thing that the metric is intended to measure and then hoping that it captures the value. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, and that's, you know, it's funny because you hear as an entrepreneur and, and you hear so many entrepreneurs and you hear so many business people or whatever. So it's like, well, these teachers, you know, they, if you can't, if you can't do it, you go teach, you know, and they, they act as if what you're doing is really not what the fuck we're doing. And it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, that's bullshit. These guys know their shit. They just chose this past to go teach people. But, but academia is, is equally as difficult and hard and, and uh, uh, competitive, if, if not more, in some senses, 
than being out here, me putting a bid in or whatever on another thing. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? There are quite a bit more similarities than people give credit for. So, um, so one thing that I would never say to my students, and in fact, I object when they say it is, well, in the real world blank. Yeah, right? like because, you're not in it. Well, because the, the truth is that in some ways we still are a little too easy on college students. It's sort of like uh, for a lot of people, it's uh, sort of high school plus. And so there, there are, then there, there's a number of sort of uh, laws around uh, sort of being their parents in absentia kind of thing. That, that require universities to take closer care of their students than maybe an employer would. But with that said, a lot of the interpersonal dynamics are exactly the same as they're going to be uh, in, in, the, in the workplace. And so, so I don't see that, Brian. I mean, it feels real to me. I know that you know, my, my success or failure in all of that is gonna, depend, you know, gonna influence whether or not I have a, a roof over my head and a full belly. Um, so, so I think there's a lot of uh, similarities between them. Um, and the other thing, I guess, is that a lot of businesses, honestly, have a similar model. Certainly law firms and consultancies where you have to get a partnership um, is very much the same model. So, you know, unless you consider, uh, you know, consultancies and accounting firms uh, uh, and, and law firms to sort of not be businesses, then, then I'm, I'm not, you know, you, academia is not unique in this. Um, but essentially what academics do is, okay, so let me back up a step. At South Carolina, I had a, a guy who taught me the capstone strategic management class. And he was, a, you know, he was a, a fine gentleman. Um, he worked for, uh, and these names will mean nothing to you guys because it's not 1974 anymore, but he worked for Hal Janine at ITT. And this would have been the sort of Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos of his day. He was the celebrity CEO of his day. The problem I ran into is that my strategic management prop was basically telling war stories from 20 years ago. And yeah. ITT was a conglomerate of which there are very few left, at least when I was taking his class. Right, a conglomerate, which is so GE is a good example. So you've got, you know, the jet engines and banking and dishwashers. Help yeah. you know, what do they have in common? And ITT was kind of like that. The reason I tell this long-winded story is because um, it would be tempting to hear his war stories and say, well, that's just the way the business world is, right? He, he's telling me how it really is on the ground. But the truth is that's how it really was 15 or 20 years before this in that company. And I do think that that's extraordinarily valuable information to have for the company you're working for. What we as academics do is we look at a bunch of those situations and it's necessary, it's gonna be thinner, the, our, uh, our base of knowledge is gonna be thinner because it's spread across more companies. But I think that's what you'd rather have. You'd rather have somebody up there telling you that here are the different ways that different companies create and, uh, and, and generate value. And look, you know, I wasn't there for Elon Musk and his decisions around Solar City, but I've read a lot about this stuff. And I will tell you sort of where the, the general consensus, you know, where he got it right, where he got it right. They did just those kinds of stories. So it's no less practical just because I wasn't the one in the, uh, the C-suite chair at that time. So, so there's a, you know, again, war stories are great. They're incredibly valuable but it takes a long time to accumulate them. And if you can yeah. come to somebody like, you know, me or an MBA program to give you the sort of generalizable story, then, then that's what you're getting there. And, and so, you know, yes, there will be differences when you get your actual job or when you try to start your actual company, because we just, you know, I'm not a life coach. I'm not, you know, I'm not your consultant. I'm a guy who's kind of trying to help you manage this based on the way other people have managed it in the past. Uh, so, so, you know, so, so yes, now I'll stop there. So, I, well, I, you know, I started as a business major and um, took econ and, and, and accounting. And I just, you know, I've said it on a couple of my blogs already that they just made it too hard. And I don't say they made it too hard, but I didn't fucking want to be an accountant and I didn't want to be a damn e economist, you know, and, um, what I found in the business school of that, which was a which was a damn great business school for what it was. I mean, it was one of, you know one of the tops at that level, but um, 
I was like, they're not teaching me how to deal with people, you know, and, and I wanted more of a generalized base. And I, and I was like, the more we, we drop down into this, it becomes two plus two is fucking four and you can't change that. And, and if I go to, you know, this company or this company or this company, they're going to teach me their world, you know? So right. I wanted more of a general base. And, 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 and when I went into public relations, everybody joked and laughed and said, Oh man, you just want to go into communications because it's easy. But in fact, it was that I went and studied the damn, you know, the classes that I would take. And it was theory and practice of persuasion, small group communication, all these different things that I thought were going to teach me about people, you know, because I was like, you're not teaching me how to deal with people. I can learn business, but I can't learn people that easily, especially in the field when you're stuck. So, you know, I went that way to that whole generalize and, 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 and I got to take, um, uh, you know, let's see, a, it was more like a survey of marketing, a survey of advertisement, yeah, yeah. a survey of management. So it was a generalized yeah, yeah. of each one of those. And I use it every day. Um, you know, we've got a big push now and you know, I own a, a you know, a, a audio video security company. And so I'm in that trade world with a college degree, but I'm, you know, I'm running the company and everything, but we need these tradespeople, you know, so we're trying to, in, in my world, trying to get more trades, you know, people coming in. But I find that, that sort of the, the way people are talking about it is like, you know, fuck college, that's stupid. You can't do that. You need to go to trade school. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, man. I think it's a better thing to say that we try to, you know, somehow tag who's going to be what and, and guide them in that direction. But don't say that academia or a four-year university is bullshit because I still to this day, every fucking day, man, I use something that I learned in college in my real world, you know, scenario, whether it be the marketing, whether it be the management, whether it be, you know, whatever. I mean, I think back to my professors and they were fantastic and they were great mentors and um, so it's sort of the same, which, which is what you're saying. So anyway, man, I, I just think a lot of people, for some reason, think you guys are just up there doing nothing. And, you know, when in fact, you're actually molding as you should be. Well, it's, so there's two things that, that you made me think of. The first one is that I'm going to be real blunt about it. Just like in every occupation, there is some dead wood in my business. Sure. And make no mistake that being impossible to fire does make some people seem slightly lazier. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I understand, you know, if, if that's, you know, if you had more of those professors uh, than, than the good ones, I can see why you might, you know, your sample might lead you to believe that none of us do anything. Um, the reason I study business instead of philosophy, among many others, is business is in everything it doesn't matter what you want to learn about know about study business probably has a hand or tentacle somewhere in that game it has it in marriage i was talking about this today business is in marriage so you don't think it's a business until you get a divorce and then all of a sudden it's a fucking business but besides that yeah. besides that you got to run a household you know and gary and becker won a nobel prize with pretty much those uh, those insights with some more math. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Back in the <laughs> 70s. I mean, that's that's the other problem with academia is whatever you th whatever insight you think you just had. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Aristotle probably said something about it and people have been working on it since then. <laughs> it's actually gotten yeah. frustrated. I'm not going to lie. I remember you uh, <clears throat> you said to me one time you were you're talking about me as a student. And um, I think you, you talked about being a hard ass and, and, and sometimes maybe being disappointed in students. And you were like, and then I thought about you and you were like, um, and you would have just come to my class, took your fucking C or D and left and been happy with it and been fine, you know, because it was some classes that I was just like, yeah, whatever. This is not, I was there to get, to get an education, but I also, it was a piece of paper that said I was trainable, you know, for the future to show someone I started something and finished it. But in the meantime, learning, but there were things that I knew that I was like, I'm not going to use this. This is not practical to me, but I'm here and I got to take it and I'll do it. You know, I'll find a place here in there. But to me, it was no reason to have an A in that. But what I found was the things that I thought were going to actually be something for what I wanted to do. I made A's in because it excited me. Now, there's a lot of ways people can take that. They can take that as, well, you were lazy over here and happy over here. But I really was looking for my future. And, you know, my roommates, which you know them all, 
were fucking with me about my grades. And I was like, well, we'll just compare paychecks one day. I don't know. I don't, you know, I was like, I don't know what to tell you, but I don't care about law and ethics. I care about the ethics, but I don't really care about the law. I didn't care about accounting more so than to say you have money, you don't have money, you're owed money and you owe money. I was going to hire an accountant at some point to figure out the rest and to put them in the subcategories. Um, it wasn't that I thought accounting was stupid. It was just that I was like, that's not what I want to focus on. And then when I became a business owner and, 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 you know, especially when I got a business coach, it taught me to put the right people in the right place and you focus on what you're great at and don't try to do everything. Because if you try to do everything, you're never going to be worth the shit. You got to, you got to be able to let shit go and, and, and allow people to step up to the plate. Would you agree to that? Or what would you say to that? Well, I guess that my first instinct is, um, has accounting come up in your life since you decided it wasn't important? Has it, has it ever sort of, uh, has it ever emerged as, or the law, has that ever emerged as something that it's helpful to know more about? Because the, I, I, I suspect it is, and the reason I ask is because one of the challenges that I think we run into in our early 20s, particularly, is there's just a mass of knowledge and we kind of need to know it all to be successful. And I take your story as one of what order should I learn it in? Yeah. Right. So you felt as though, and, and the other point about sort of business being every, you know, having, having its, uh, having its feelers on everything is that organizational behavior is a standard course that you would have to take in a business school curriculum. Right. So we would have taught you how to deal with people and a lot of the psychology and, and uh, psychology of persuasion and influence and these kinds of things. So so we do this in business school, uh, oftentimes in terms of sort of managing organizations. Marketing has a mountain of psychology and persuasion kinds of things in it. So I take your story, honestly, as we all need to know, everybody needs to know some technical accountancy, some technical finance, some softer skills dealing with uh, reflection wisdom how to deal with people that kind of thing and and so the, the the people who mess up i think feel like you know now i've learned this i don't need that other thing but the truth is it's all important you have yeah. to have all that stuff and and you just should have chose a slightly different order because most times in b school we would give you the technical skills and then I guess you're supposed to figure out the interpersonal stuff on your own, you know, and so, uh, and which, you know, people can do. And honestly, some people are just better at that. Some people have a natural talent for working with people and that kind of thing. I put you on that list, frankly, you sort of, you sort of studied what you were already good at in a very real sense. Um, well, I wanted to but, be but better at, you know, what order you have to do them in, not whether yeah. or not any of this is more or less important. I think it was that I, I, I thought I had a talent at something and, you know, my dad sort of guided me that way. And so I was like, you know, to get better at my talent, <clears throat> I want to do this. You know, I wanted to study my talent. And it wasn't that I, I, I didn't want to ultimately go after something. I, you know, my surrogate father and, and business mentor up in college, I asked him, you know, he was an art, he got an art uh, scholarship and went into business and it, and became an accounting major. And I said, well, so why, why did you get an accounting degree? And then, and then a master's. And he said, because I knew I was going to own a business and I needed to know where the fuck my money was going. Right. So he did that in, in the way that I would have that. So I, I want to, like you said, a different route. I just said, I want to hone my talent and then worry about the other shit later. You know, but I was also, I didn't know my family was pushing me to be a business owner, but I, I thought more than anything, I would be great at sales, you know, and so that was the path I was kind of rolling in. And then as a, as a, as a, as a business owner, that's more what I do, but I don't like to call it sales, you know, more so than anything, I build relationships, you know, and then I, I just kind of walk around that instead. But the point is, is that, you know, the college world really did show me something and, and, and it gave me something that I use every day. And I don't like to, you know, just kind of dance around and act like it didn't happen. It did. It was there. And even the classes that I didn't do. Well. So the counting, the, the law, it does come up. And, and I do have to sit down with my accountant. And I do have to say, explain this to me. But I did, you know, I won an accounting award in high school. So, you know, I, I had that mindset. But I think as a musician and, and with a creative mind, the numbers, you know, it, it's hard to be structured. Does that make sense? 
I had this, no, I had this, uh, so I will just share with you my experience in accounting because I was, you know, pretty solid with numbers, honestly. Um, and I sat down in accounting and I think largely because of my preconceptions about what, how to balance a checkbook. It was, I was there for about two and a half weeks and I didn't understand a word, right? <laughs> They're, and, you know, they're scribbling stuff up there. And I'm a sophomore. I mean, I've done college. This was not, you know, I was not fresh off the farm. Uh, so they are. Uh, and and then and this is this was actually kind of a life lesson for me, because at some point around the end of week three, everything just fell into play. I remember where I was sitting at that moment. It was in Walker Hall on the third floor that we and. And everything just suddenly made perfect sense. And I've never had any trouble with accounting since. I've taken five accounting classes since then. It was like, oh yeah, this, 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 this. And, and it's an interesting lesson. I mean, again, I don't know if this applies to everyone, but for me, it was a lesson in, you just never know when that breakthrough. I mean, this is, this is one of the crazy things about predicting the future, right? Is that, you know, you never know if you are, um, you know, what is it, Mark Twain? Uh, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, and then quit. No reason to be a damn fool about it. And so <laughs> you never know which side of that Mark Twain equation you are on, right? Is whether or not, you know, you should just give up. You probably don't have this versus any minute now, it's all just going to fix itself somehow. Yeah. And, and that's kind of my story with accounting, honestly. It's just, it's just, oh, oh. And see, they have something, honestly, the word debit. Really, once I figured out the role of the word debit, it, it really kind of fell into place for me. Yeah, so the uh, it was sort of me. You know, I had problems during the damn crash. And we'll talk about that for a minute. We do have a question here. Hold me this question. We got a question from, you remember Snipe Eye, old, old uh, Scott Snipus out in San Diego, our, our scientist. Yeah. So Scott's, uh, Scott's coming uh, on this show eventually. So he said, Rob, since you are not a business coach, how much do you charge to access the information you've researched? How can I obtain the information from you? <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, I mean. Uh, hey, he's fucking rich. Make sure you know he's loaded. No, no, so, <laughs> so it depends. I don't know what information he is seeking, right? That, that's the question. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what he's talking about. So, what? first of all, what up, Scott? Uh, <laughs> good to see you. Or good also, to real Bye. quick. Real huh? quick, Nez said, uh, Martin Nesbitt, Nez said, give Rob my regards. It's been a long time. What up, so Nez? Nez, Nez what is up, watching Nez? live as well. So we got we got App State in the house. All right, all right. No, um, yeah, so so there is a thing called okay, so one of the biggest controversies in my business it has to do with publishing, right? So the publishers actually make all the money. This is one of the best business models I've ever experienced is that they get people like me to do the research. They get people like me to review the research. They get people like me to be the editors of this research. And I don't get paid for any of those things. Right. <laughs> and then the publisher hits you at a thousand dollars a year to, uh, to be, you know, to subscribe to this journal. If you're an institution, and then they just rake it in. I mean, it's uh, it's good work if you can get it. The reason I mention this is because there's something called Sci-Hub, S-C-I-H-U-B, where they basically, if you've got a DOI, a, a, a document identifying permanent number, you can look up any of these things that you would ordinarily need library access to get. So, if what you mean is how can I get published research without getting through a paywall, the answer is Sci-Hub. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. There you go, Snipers. There, 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 that's, uh, so that's the same as damn uh, being in the music industry and, and why yes, I never signed very much a, the same. Why I, why I never signed a record deal. I had three small bullshit record label deals, you know, and I mean, I, you know, hindsight's 2020, you, you could, you know, you, what if I would have signed it, but I'm not pissed or angry or whatever, but it was like, we'll give you $20,000 and you owe us three albums and fucking your kids and your blood type and whatever. And, and I was just like, this is a shit deal, dude. I could go fucking borrow 20 grand and make my own album. Now with that said, most bands coming up young and whatever, they got to go through that bullshit. 
to get to where they are, but they got to fight out of that contract. I mean, the Crows had had a had a uh, had a you know they, there was a clause in a contract that they found out of nowhere that they're you know that they were able to actually make millions after the fact. Um, you know, TLC, for instance, these girls sold what fourteen million copies, and all three of them made fifty thousand dollars a year for two years on 14 million fucking copies. So right. somebody's making the money and these girls aren't making shit. And then everybody's mad at them for filing bankruptcy. And it was like, no, they, they actually owed. <laughs> Not only did they only get paid, but these people made millions on them. And then, and then said these girls owed them a bunch of damn money. So it, you know, you, you got to watch that shit and it is what it is. So well, when you talk about the only difference between the music business and my business is that I do have respect for a good a &R person. Right, so, right. Right. So I do, I do respect somebody who's got to sit through like a hundred terrible bands to get to a rusty one good band, one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the one, I'm the editor. I'm my own A&R <laughs> guy in the, the business I was talking about. So you don't even have to do that part if you're in the publishing business. So, so there is, you know, one small, you know, because I've spent a lot of time thinking about uh, I had some students one time, you know, they, back in the days of Napster. I don't want to date myself, but you can see the grades. Yeah, um, you can, you're dated. <laughs> you're dated. I hid my shit. Uh, it's no, all, un, all my grades uh, under. So. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm still not just for manning yet, but. Um, yeah. No, uh, I didn't just for man. <laughs> it's all under. I'm still there. It's just under. <laughs> the, 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 oh, the, man. Yeah. The wear on the face shows my age. Uh, so it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so well, they the beard saying, is fully you know, gray. The, uh, my students are saying, yeah, of course I'd steal music, right? You know, the artists don't get any of the money anyway. And so it actually, I was like, I want to, what do record companies do? And this was actually a very interesting sort of line of research for me is trying to figure out, uh, you know, what value exactly do these uh, basically filtering and vetting organizations, what, what value do they add? And a lot of it just is, those you know, hundred nights in a in a, in dirty, nasty late night clubs, trying to find the Beastie Boys or trying yeah. to find you know the, the the one band that's going to make your name. Well, they shitted a bunch of people, but then you know, then you you know, but you it's all about negotiating the contract. The problem is you get young kids that don't know a fucking thing about a contract, and they're just. Ooh, I get this much money, and ooh, you're gonna make. They don't me have famous. any power anyway. I mean, the the truth is that you know, in in early in my business and in the music business, you just want people to read and listen, and yeah. you know that that's all I care about, and I'm willing to starve to make that happen unless and until it turns out that people like my stuff, and then and that's why a lot of that game for me is uh, like it's the same in books. If that makes you feel any better, so you know, yeah. The, if I'm if I'm publishing a book, oftentimes the publishers will have right of first refusal over the next book, but the next three albums that's just greed. I mean, that's, yeah. Oh, it gets so there. I, yeah, yeah. I'll give you an option on my next one, but but again, they've got you know young musicians. It's just like being a professor in some ways. Is it's such a good gig if you hit it that it's actually kind of worth the chance of washing out. Athlete well, you told you, you t I think you told me you said, I think the two best gigs on the planet are a fucking, you know, a rock star that made it and, and, a, and, and, and a professor, you know, and, and uh, I, I was like, I was like, well, I, I kind of got a good gig, too. <laughs> I used to say that uh, rock star and professional athlete were better until I watched these poor bastards try to retire. Yeah. Right. My I get better. Like this is actually like uh, chops in academia. Yeah, <laughs> but nobody wants to see this up on stage. On stage, power, right? <laughs> well, not yet, and not anymore. You know, so it's like it's like I tell people, I'm like, my songs are better, right? I'm writing better songs, and uh, but I'm like, nobody wants to see my fat old ass anymore. You know, so I'm not I'm not getting famous anymore, but I can hang out here in the Charlotte world and still rock a crowd. But you know, getting man, up and there, just but... watching athletes try to retire is just gut-wrenching man so yeah this is all you've done since you were 12 and now it's and they done. can't do it anymore and you got 40 more years ahead of you unless you're in the nfl and then you got 10 but you you know if you're in basketball yeah. or baseball you got 40 more years 
what you going to do now? What have you learned how to do over all of this? Because this you've party? spent that whole time doing it. And then you've had people come in and fuck you and giving you their money to invest in shit that they ultimately made money on. And you sit there holding the bag and crashing. I mean, I do a lot of work for athletes and race car drivers and things. And I was thinking about that. You know, if I can get them on here, you know, what you know, and I, I've met a few, and I'm I'm not going to name them. I, I do security for quite a few of these guys, but I do talk to them about you know what what what's next, and I feel bad for them because just like you said, you spent your damn whole life doing this, and now it's over. And um, I had a really good friend of mine, and he fought hard. He's he was a D lineman. You know, he played 11 years in the NFL. I mean, he made money, and everybody thinks, oh my yeah. god, they made all this money. Well, they forget that there's a lot of money that went to agents and taxes and this and that. But I remember talking to one, one time and he said to me, I said, well, man, you've done well, you know, you got a $900,000 house, but you were a first round draft pick and this and that. So you didn't buy the $5 million house and you're driving a, you know, a Toyota Tacoma and not a fucking $80,000 car, whatever back then at the time. And I looked at him, I said, so you're probably good for life. And his wife looked at me and she said 60. And I went, she's done the math. She did the math because they were smart and they, they actually had a damn good financial planner. And she said, what we want in life is four kids. That means four weddings, four colleges, you know, blah, blah. She said, if he never plays another down starting today, we got till 60. If the market holds basically, you know, and because otherwise he's going to have to work. Because 60, you know, I mean, and, and, and we, you, you mentioned football, a lot of them die early and I get it, but I'm, but instead of getting into that subject, which we will another day at another time, you know, you know, what, what's he going to do now? And here's the thing, you leave a job, let's say you're a fucking low level NFL player, you're $350,000 a year. That's a lot of money, right? It's not a lot of money, but it's a lot of money. Then you come out five years later and the best thing you're going to get with what you know that you're a psychology major let's say you're a business administration major, you're gonna get a fifty thousand dollar a year job because you have no experience you haven't been able to work your way up so now you're older and you know these people these young kids are coming in and they're fired up and they're working so it's a it's it's a it's an issue that a lot of people don't think about with these athletes and thinking about how they can go broke you know, everybody thinks you can just go save your money, save your money, save your money, but it doesn't really work that way. And this guy protected his money. Now he played four more years, which gave them probably till the end of his life. And they only had three kids versus four. So <laughs> that was, you know, $250,000 or whatever, you know, but I think you got to look at that. And I don't think people do. Now, the cool thing, like you said, with you, you can work until you're 80. Night. I mean, you it's, can... it's actually a bit of a problem right now. So I'm, I've got several friends who are deans and this kind of thing. And I had wondered with the uh, with the plague coming on, if some number of these. So so there's a lot of it's such a good gig, right? That that every year, you know, from the time you are 59 and a half, I think most of the people I know start. Is next year the year to retire? And no, the, the job's too good. You know, no, the, the, apparently this wasn't the year. And so then you do get people up into their 70s uh, who are sort of filling a chair, honestly. And I had wondered if now that they've got to completely rejigger this class that they've been teaching the same way since the 1900s, if they're going to have to rejigger that thing for an online format, will that make them decide this year is the year? Yeah, fuck this. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm out. The reports I'm getting are quite the opposite. The reports I'm getting are people who were thinking about retiring, see the stock market, maybe not doing what they had hoped it would do at the end of their careers. And so now they're actually going to stick around and probably deliver some mediocre content into the Zoom box. Uh, So, yeah, that was a little disappointing. But but again, that, you know, in a way that I, you know, I don't know what it feels like to be a defensive lineman trying to retire. I do know that the more gray hair you have in my business, the more respect you get, whether it's earned or not. I mean, the truth is that getting old just means you fail to die, you know, right on. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, right, yeah. so, so, you know, uh, 
So, I told somebody. I told somebody the other day. They were. They were like, uh, I don't. I don't force my kids to say yes, ma'am, and no, sir, just because you're older. And somebody looked at me and was like, Elders deserve, you know, respect. Oh, and I'm no. like, there, I'm like, there's some fucking murderers that are older than you. I mean, yeah. you know, bullshit. No. They didn't no. earn my if kids. You deserve respect. respect. I give you respect, but just not <laughs> dying is uh, is it's not. Yeah, just because you live longer. Respect. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about um, a couple other things, man. So now. You, you were at U of R and, um, well, I, hey, I'll tell you what, let's do this. You're a business ethics professor. Tell this crowd what that means. Okay. Um, so it, was, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the, uh, learning the technical elements versus some of the, uh, some of the so-called soft skills. Um, so we all know that the, the price mechanism, you know, you, you, anybody who's done intro to econ has seen sort of the uh, pricing, you know, the curves and all that. And that's how you know where equilibrium is and, and, and all of that. And the thing that is different about free market capitalism versus uh, something like communism, socialism, uh, is that that price mechanism coordinates behaviors. Right. I don't have to tell you go make more shoes because the market's telling you to make more shoes or raise your price. And so the market is just that kind of thing. Underestimated, underrated, undervalued in that conversation is the coordination role of norms and ethics. Right. So how often have you, you know, should I do X? And somebody says, you know, yeah, we haven't really done it that way before, right? And that's, you find that off-putting, right? Or, you know, at, 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 uh, at U of R, it was a very small school, very liberal, you know, very small liberal arts school. And uh, so there weren't all the policies and procedures that you get at a sort of big state institution with tens of thousands of people. So I would go to people and I would say, you know, hey, how did, you know, is there a policy on blank? And they would say, no, but this is how it's always been done. And it coordinates behavior at least as well and probably better than a big list of bureaucratic rules and regulations. In fact, the way, the way I tell my students is, um, if you want to know the, the real rules of an organization, go in and ask somebody, uh, you know, what happened the last time somebody blanked, Right. And yeah. that's your culture. That is the yeah. organization's culture. And, and I don't care what the regulation manual says. If whatever happened last t the last two times somebody blanked, that's what's going to happen if you try to blank. Yeah, right? and it, whatever it that is, not right. It matter what the, what the financials say or what the balance sheet says. None of that. It's just, and so I study ethics because this is the norms that hold society together. Right. This is what we expect of each other. And we and if you don't match that, if you don't meet that, um, then you're on the outs. You're not going to work well here. I, uh, I studied fairness. That's what I wrote my dissertation and my first book about. And fairness, it turns out, you know, I don't you probably heard this. I, I, I met your old man and I bet he sometimes said life's not fair or right. Sometimes, you know, and, yeah. Wait till they get treated badly. Right, all those yeah. people who say life's not fair. If then them motherfuckers are ready to fight. Fairness, you are a literal psychopath, right? You are clinical. If you don't care about fairness in society, we have a clinical description of that, right? And 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 so, the reason I think it's interesting is because there are at least three different kinds of fairness that that people are talking past each other about, right? So do you think you should be able to work extra hard this year and get an extra vote in November? No, right? Because we distribute some things based on equality, right? And so there's equity, equality, and need. Equity is, did you earn it, right? So we don't think that everybody in a class should get the same grade. We don't think that every business person should get the same salary. Some people earn more and less. With that said, um, it doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter in general how much money you have at the McDonald's drive through Rich guys don't get to go to the front of the line at McDonald's, right? Right. Uh, so you wait in line like everybody else or have somebody yeah. wait in line for you. Either way, equality, right? It's the same thing with voting. And then there's need. 
right? So it, you know, so it, it, it doesn't matter that you've been waiting in the emergency room with your broken finger for five hours because the person with the bone sticking out of their leg gets to go ahead of you, yeah. right? And nobody yeah. thinks that's unfair. The challenge right. that we keep running into is that people have different, yeah, they're talking past each other. I'm talking about meritocratic earned fairness and you're talking about need-based fairness, right? And, right. Those, and, you know, and unless you understand that distinction, you're never really going to understand why you're disagreeing. Yeah. And there's yeah. tons of psychology about the effects on your organization of these different regimes, right? So it turns out that equity, merit, increases performance in goal-based, uh, in goal-based initiatives, but it also increases the amount of uh, sort of backstabbing. Yes. Right? So I don't have to, you know, I don't have to be great. I just have to be better than you. And so like uh, William and Mary, again, this is all hearsay that I haven't been there, but, but I'm told that places with a strict curve on their grades, like resources go missing in the library. And, and right. So little things like that. And, and, and it's all, and, and again, it's true in organizations as well. If you have a very sales metric oriented organization, I'm less interested in you doing well, right? I'm not really going to jump and take one for the team here to help you, right? Whereas well, cut, it, it, it becomes, so what you're talking about is cutthroat. You know, you're talking about cutthroat in that, right? Yeah. So it, you might get better sort of metric based performance, but the esprit de corps is going to suffer. Yeah. Alternatively, if you have equality, maybe you've had, you know, you've worked in a group where clearly somebody wasn't working as hard as everybody else. And you don't throw them over because all of our well-being is dependent on that person stepping up. And yeah. so you sort of bring them along. Trying to bring them up. Right, up right. Sort of, uh, it was a sports mentality per se, you know, in, in a sense. You know, Michael Jordan is not going to say, fuck him. I'm going to bring him up. We need a team, you know, type of yeah. thing. You know, Music's the same and, thing. And, I mean, so, so if you're the sort of second seat trombone, you're not sort of hitting the first guy, hoping he messes up, right? You're yeah. doing your thing and, and, you know, trying to get in where you fit in and, and, and hoping that somebody will notice you down the road. I remember watching uh, uh, Deion Sanders, and, 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 and I'm going back to sports because it just seems like we kind of run into, run into there. But when he was playing for, uh, I think it was, might have been New York, it might have been the Braves, but anyway, he was playing baseball. And he was talking, he said, I was watching people on my team wanting people to strike out so they could get up there. Yeah. You know, and so um, and he said, and that's bullshit. We're trying to fucking win. And 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 who cares what you get? We all want to win. So interesting. You know, I've got my daughter is in her second year of really organized sports and in track. And it's an individual type thing. You're running track. You're trying to damn, you know, you're, you're running against your time. But, you know, last year they had a great team, meaning they had a bunch of badass runners. What I found in their team was that they were all trying to beat each other. And this year, I spent a lot of time with her talking about, listen, you guys lost number one by how many seconds? And the reason you lost number one in the region is because you were too fucking busy worrying about who was fifth and who was fourth and who was third. You didn't act as a team. So I've been trying to get them to go in there and run as a team. And I was like, imagine if this girl's here, you're imagine if you got to here, now you're pushing her, she's pushing you, everybody's pushing each other. And now you're unstoppable. You're, you, you know, you, you're, you, you're, you can't be defeated. And I think I try to run that with my, when there was a point in time in my company that it was, it was acid. I mean, it was just fucking poison. Everybody thought everything, you know, we weren't a team and some things went down. Some, some organizational changes happened. I got everybody together. A lot of them didn't know who I was. You know, they really didn't know me. And we spent some time together and I was like, listen, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm here for you. You know, we got to win this damn thing together. I can't, you know, I'm not shit without you and you're not shit without me. You know, I mean, you can go work for someone else, whatever. But at the end of the day, if we build this thing, we can all we can all be great. And, you know, let's all work together. And so I think what you're saying is basically what I what what I think every organization needs to do is let's work as a team. Am I correct in this? But but also so close. So to me, anyway, 
um, and this is a this is a heavy thing to drop in the last two minutes or so. But uh, I believe that you're not two minutes, dude. We got we got whoa whoa whoa! Don't say that. We started at seven. We're we're eight thirty. You got oh, is it eight thirty? Okay, good. Well, yeah, then don't okay. don't try to walk better. on me, bitch. You're fucking I staying. I believe that one of the most important tensions, maybe in the world, is the tension between cooperation and competition in business. Okay. Right? Because it's so when we think of free markets, it's supposed to be competitions making us all better. And, and I think that's part of the story that you're saying is that, you know, it's, uh, there, there's some teams, honestly, that, that I just need to beat my teammates because we're that much better than everybody else in the county or the state or the league or whatever. That if I beat you, I probably win the state championship or right. something to that effect. Right. But you don't trip that person to beat them. And so the yeah. thing between. The tension between cooperation and competition uh, is, uh, if you can find that sweet spot, that is, is in general, a, a really a really good way to succeed in business. If we can figure out a way that uh, we, and cooperation, by the way, has its own pitfalls. There are some organizations around right now who are over loyal, I think it's safe to say. Right. So no matter what somebody else on my team does, I'm standing by my team. Yeah. Yeah. Concept, for example, called the blue lie. So a blue lie is a lie. It's not like a white lie. A blue lie is a lie. We all know it, but it's in service of our thing. And so I let it slide. And so right. very often cooperation can be taken uh, to an ineffective uh, extreme. Right. And so so that's why, you know, again, finding that balance within your organization and then between organizations, between competition and cooperation is uh, is one of those sweet spots. Are there some organizations out there right now that you look at that you are impressed with? I'm sure there's some, but can you name a couple? Oh, that's a, I should have that off the top of my head. And, and I always struggle with that one. Not least because all actors are just mixed, right? It, it's, a, it's a problem, right? We, we, we live in the age of the summary judgment where Tesla is bad or Tesla is great. And it turns out that when you have thousands and thousands of people in an organization working together, they're kind of a little bit of both. We're all fundamentally flawed actors. Right. And so okay. every so I'll tell you a quick war story. So I'm writing this paper and it's uh, and it's gotten into the top journal. This is the gold standard of my profession is getting an article in a top journal. And we were using at the time we were looking at examples of companies and we used Volkswagen as one of our positive examples. And in between the time that the article was accepted and the time it was published, Volkswagen and Dieselgate comes out where they were unambiguously terrible, terrible things going on, right? <laughs> yeah. Every, you know, they knew in that organization that they were lying to the regulator systematically. Yeah. <laughs> so now I tell and you're, Volkswagen, and they're the, and they're your gold standard, oh, yeah. right? Oh, you're yeah. like fucking Volkswagen rules. <laughs> well, it was, you know, again, it's academic. Yeah, yeah, no, I know what you mean. But, yeah, yeah. but yes, they were clearly the more positive of the four companies that we were looking <laughs> at in this particular context. And so, you know, so again, I've been burned by examples more than my share of times where I try to say, you know, this company is great. Uh, and then people say, yeah, but they do this other thing that's not great. And and the truth is that it, the summary judgment is a pox. We have no bit, nobody is straight good or straight bad. Every sinner has a future and every saint has a past. And yeah. right, just, just stop yeah. with the summary judgment stuff and, and try to, you know, take, take actors as they are and then try to, you know, see what, you know, see what they might do better, right? So I'm not saying this, because I don't judge because, you know, I judge a lot. Oh, I've seen you judge. I've right? seen. <laughs> yeah, so, so it looks at like, you know, Patagonia seems to be, you know, they seem to stand by what they say they're going to do. They, you know, allow people to take these sort of personal sabbaticals to go off and refresh themselves. 
they seem to be liked by their stakeholders. And this is what going back to the business ethics thing. Would you would you charge a premium to work for a shady company and maybe charge a you know work at a discount if you believed in the mission and the values of that company? And I think a lot I'll of tell you, Rob. I mean, you know, there are people that I don't do business with. There you go. Right I mean, it's go. just a fucking fact. I have fired clients yep. um, because I just thought they were dirty. Um, now, I have some tough clients. I, I just ran into a situation um, with a guy, uh, and he's, you know, he's tough. He's real tough. I've got, well, let me say this. I've got a lot of tough clients. They expect a lot. And I'm fine with that as long as they're not asking me to go above and beyond or, or somewhere left or right that I, that I don't believe I should be. And most of my clients I've, I've found, and, and I don't know if it's that I, I draw them to me or I don't know if it's that just I, I pick and choose well. Who knows? I don't know if I've just been fucking lucky. But this guy's a tough damn, he's a tough customer. And um, he, he's, uh, he's a business owner. And um, we went in to change out some stuff for him. And uh, we were putting in some uh, thermostats so that he can control it on his phone. And he approved the quote like that. He's never not paid. He is not, I mean, dude, the payment, boom, you know? And so when people pay, you're like, all right. So, you know, that, you know, that, but you know that those guys that pay, they're tough because right they're like, so. damn it. I didn't hold you out. I paid you motherfucker. I want this shit done. You know? So we left this man at his house without air condition for a whole night. Unknowingly, I, I had a young guy working for me. He went over there and, 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 and tried to set these things. He made the mistake. My employee fucked up. And uh, it, it's a simple, simple mistake, but he did. He blew a fuse. So this guy had no fucking air conditioning. At 545, I wake up to go to the gym and my phone is, it's like, it's, it's like this man knew my ass woke up and he was like, Hey man, I tried to get someone to talk to me last night at 12 o'clock midnight, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, shit. And I look, and he's like, it was 88 degrees in my house. And I have, I've slept in a hot house and fuck that. Yeah. Right. So immediately, man, I was like, I don't know what's going on. Let me figure this out. And he's on my ass, but rightfully so. So I sent somebody over there. It turned out to be our fault. I actually called him on the phone. I was talking to him on the phone. He was pissed, man. He was mad. And, um, you know, he said, are you going to pay for this? And I said, listen, if it's my fault, I got it. You know, well, then you were the last. And I said, I know I was the last one there. I'm not saying it's not my fault, but I do need to dig a little bit. Just give me a minute, you know. But anyway, at the end of the day, it was our fault. We fixed it. I had to pay the HVAC company to fix it. Um, and it was no questions asked. Um, when he called me on the phone and wanted to get in my ass a little bit, a couple of times I kind of tried to, you know, talk before I should have. And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me finish. He was like, I understand shit happens. What I'm pissed off about was the lack of the communication. And that was really what his anger was. Between midnight and 6 a.m.? I know, but still, well, fuck, if your ass was without fucking, you know, you're sitting there sweating balls, right? Yeah. You would be pissed too. Well, you know? What I the fuck, the you know? <laughs> so you. I explained that to him and he understood. But anyway, at the end of the day, we fixed it. And I told him, I said, look, man, I would have put your ass up in a hotel before I would have let you sleep another night like that. And he knew it. And here's the thing. You get into those battles with these cats, but, you know, you got to know your client. You got to understand and you got to have empathy. You know what I'm saying? And you, you got to know, and I think this is the ethical side of things, that you can't be like, I'm the fucking big business owner, kiss my ass, I do. You know, you got to understand, man, that your clients are people too. And and they, you know, and they care and they, you know, and they're, and they're still trying to do business with you. I mean, he wasn't, it wasn't like he was calling me going, fuck advanced tech, fuck you, you suck. He was like, Rusty, I need to talk to you, business owner to business owner, because he's a business owner. He was like, business owner to business owner, I need to tell you how I feel. And I was like, okay. Yeah. So number one, a lot of times people just want to have, you know, just vent. And so, and, and oftentimes I find that as a business owner or just an executive or, or leader of any kind, you have to take responsibility for your subordinates behavior. 
Yes. So every and, this is a every really time. good reason for hiring well. Like for yeah. to me, that's the single most important thing in any organization is picking yeah. your colleagues uh, very well uh, and people who will own that, right? So so I yep. think that that's one of the things where you know, on the one hand, it was your subordinates' fault. On the other hand, they it was mine. The boss, <laughs> right? I'm the, yeah. Oh no, there was no. Yeah. Listen, I didn't throw him under the bus. And I never do. And I think it's why my employees love me, but they, they you know, cause they'll, when, when it is their fault and I get in their ass a little bit, you know, I've had them go, well, man, you, you don't need to talk to me this way. And I'm like, dude, yeah, I do. You need to know that you fucked up. I'm not, listen, I'm not cussing you, but you, you made a mistake. So the question is, how do we not do this again? I took the heat. I always take the heat. It's my company. It all ends right. That's how my daddy raised me. It's how my grandmother, grandfather raised me. I mean, that, you know, that's the military background. You take responsibility. It's my fucking company. It's my responsibility. But, you know, he made the mistake. He was just a rookie. It wasn't that I yeah, hired exactly. back. It was something that, and I, and, and, and he and I had the conversation. I said, listen, I'm not bashing you. And the first thing all employees tell you, I'll pay for it. And it's like, no. <laughs> well, let me, I, I want to, I want to hit stop right there. Cause that is okay. not the first thing that all employees tell you. Well, mine do. Now mine. That's what I'm talking about. My right? boy, because my people, everybody I have. Work. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Yes. My boys and, 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 and Kendall. Yeah. They, most people will say a million excuses about why it wasn't my fault. No, I, I have not. I'll tell you what, every one of my people don't. One of the, that's what you got to do. And, yeah. and that's to me is what people will remember. That's what I mean is that right now we're going through a really tough phase. Yeah. Right. And people will remember how you acted here. Do you remember a minute ago I said that if you want to know how things really work in this company, ask about the last two times something happened? Yeah. In, in your company, if somebody says, you know, what happened the last time you messed up? Right? Then, right. then you that that's how the culture of that company works. And so, so if I had it to do over again and you ask me, you know, what are some what are some good companies? I missed the opportunity here and I feel badly about this. What are some good companies that you would use uh, as an example? Advanced tech system. <laughs> That's what I should have said. I feel like no, I, I, no I, shit. I, we I don't need that podcast bro. game. So, so I didn't, I, I missed the opportunity, but uh, I'm but not I, here I'm as advanced tech. I will tell you though, that, you know, I remember, man, I had every fucking idea in the world to grow my company. And remember I had the franchising idea. And and your your you know your wife Annika and, and you and I I mean we battle so so everybody out there in the in the Zoom world Rob and I we're not always this cordial if it's a fucking fight it's a fucking fight we throw down but um you know I think what you said to me that that really resonated when I was talking about trying to grow my company it was almost a cheat grow in a way you were like you're going you're you're trying to cheat grow you know you're. You're, yep. you're, you're giving other people your fucking name that you have no control over, Rusty, to make money. And you were pissed off about that. You were like, you're going to make money, Rusty. Money's going to come. It's already happening. Look at you. You're making money. And, stuff. But, um, and, and as we battled back and forth, you eventually got in my face and you said, because I like what you do. And, and that, that, that meant the world to me. But it, but especially coming from an ethics professor, and your point was, once you franchise this, you lost control of what your brand is and who the fuck you are and how you want to do things. And I thought, you know, you were like, you can't now to, to grow and sell a company, you can do that. And, and, and but instill, you know, your world into the company because they, they can't buy you. But your point was, Going out and franchising is probably you, – you can organically grow and make as much money, if not more, and not ruin your name. And I, I really appreciated when you said that. So, But we'll yeah, get off my cover. And this is, again – okay, so you asked about business ethics. So uh, one of the things that we study in strategic management is sustained competitive advantage, right? So you can have a competitive advantage like frequent flyer miles, but it's so easily copied that it's not sustainable, right? Yeah. That anybody yeah. can do that. Right, right. Um, the reason that I think that ethics is so important in the organic growth is because you can't just buy that off the shelf. 
by yeah. definition, you had to build that. You had to build trust. You had to build stories about what happened when somebody blanked, right? All this stuff is culture and you yeah. cannot buy culture off the shelf. And yeah. as a matter of fact, if you have a culture, if you have a reputation for being shady, it's going to take you, you know, 10x as long to overcome that reputation than it would just somebody fresh off the boat who has a blank slate reputation. Right? I tell so, people so a, this, pissed this, off, this, a pissed off, a pissed off client, uh, uh, an unambiguous competitive advantage comes from organically growing, organically sorting out your culture. I think so. I think it takes time, you know, and the people that I do business with that have been in business for years and years, you know, we all talk about how do you make money? How can you, you know, so you hear the stories and I'm sure you've heard this. If you last five years, you're good. And it's like, well, no, the math might state or the percentages might state that if you last five years, you got a potential to get there, but that doesn't mean you're making money in five, you know, you're, you're, you're making a salary or whatever. But I, most of my clients that have been in business for 20, 30 years are like, it's 20 years before you really start seeing money in your pocket because you got to pay your people. You got to send back into the company. You got to make sure that the company, you know, you, and I live low and you know this, I've always lived low and I've always invested back into the company for that reason. But, but it's because of people like you and because of people like them, um, so I think that's a, I think you're right, man. You, you, you can't, that culture, you can sell the culture if someone buys your business, if that business is the culture they want. But if they're, if it's another company who has a shit culture that's trying to buy your fucking business, it's good. Your culture is going to go away like that. Look, man, what, what you have to remember is that if you can come up with this idea and buy it off a shelf, Anybody can. You're not, you know, by definition, you're not special in that moment. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, so you know, so so what do you think you have done that you know somehow other people can't just go do? And that's why, you know, you know what people can't do is build a 20-year reputation by next week. Yeah. <laughs> like, literally, there's just no way, right? Yeah. And so this is and. and and it's always the tough moments. There's always these, you know, so you told me this story and that is a, a story that I suspect you have told your other employees. I mean, this is one of the, the stories of advanced tech. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and look, if you want to know, ask you, you know, all, I don't know who else is listening out there and it kind of wears me out, but, uh, but ask yourselves right in your own organizations where you work right now. Right. So what do we stand for? Can you say it? I can. Um, I used to do this other fun exercise, right, where um, some number of companies. So how do we know every company has a value statement? Right. Every company has a mission statement. Yeah. yeah, one, of yeah. The, uh, one of the criticisms is, you know, isn't this just window dressing? Right. Isn't this just what you have to say uh, in, in these times of strife, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and. If you want to know the difference between a real values or mission statement and window dressing is the tough times, right? Anybody can throw out, you know, we all know what we're supposed to say. I mean, even literal psychopaths, that's how they get through life is they know what they're supposed to. I know I'm supposed to feel sorry for you. I don't. But I know yeah. I'm supposed to, and so I yeah. pretend, right? I've learned how to, well, Dexter, right? The, the, the show on Showtime. I, I've just learned I have no empathy or sympathy for you. I could cut you in fucking a million pieces, but I got to figure out a way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so the reason I bring it up is because it's, it's the stories that you just told where you, you know, our company, we were in a bad place, right? And here's what we did about it. Yeah. And, you know, if what you did about it is slash and burn employees and, you know, that, you know, that story will be remembered. Whatever you do during this crisis or these crises, people are going to remember that. You remember what happened in your company. You remember what happened in the companies you do business with. You know what kind of actors you're dealing with. And it's tough in the moment to actually live by your values. But if you can do that and survive, there is a clear survivorship bias. I want to make yeah. that clear, right? The, the stories that you're hearing about the, the hard times from a going concern, they made it through. You know how their story ends. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't know how your story ends, but you do know that you'll be remembered for this moment. Whatever you do right now is how we're going to remember you. And to me, you know, who do you want to be? This is Aristotle, right? This is, you know, we don't have to get all kind of fancy categorical imperative Immanuel Kant stuff. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty fucking easy. It's just, you know, you know I, I tell you my, are, I, you're becoming what you're thinking you are becoming. What you're doing is who you are. Yeah. I tell my employees, I'm like, um, I, I, it's, it's, it's a pretty simple equation in, in that. If you, you know, like basically what you're saying, what are they going to think of you? Um, how do you handle that thing? If somebody really loves you and thinks you're fucking fantastic, they might give you 10 referrals. And that's only because I think we aren't as passionate, happy as we are fucking angry. Right. So I'm like, a happy person, they'll give you 10 customers. An angry motherfucker Run will off lose you 100. You know, because <laughs> they're like, fuck this. I'm, you true. know, and I think when you're happy, you're like complacent, and somebody's like, you ever heard of that security guy? Like, oh, man, you're rusty. You know, but if someone comes to you and goes, I was thinking about uh, using advanced tech, fuck them, you know, and then it just goes down south. And I, you know, you got to, Sometimes you got to eat it, man, to make sure. But but really so much, not so much eating it for the bit. I think it goes back to the ethics side of things is that the right thing to do with my client on Tuesday was to fix his shit. We fucked it up. I didn't even know we fucked it up. But the point that I was making to my guys was because my, so the, the, the young guy, the rookie, and he's not young, but he's a rookie. He was like, man, it was working when I left. And I was like, are you sure? Are you positive? Well, the air conditioner, and I was like, did you press the buttons and hear it come on? And, and he didn't. And again, he was a rookie. It was, not, I, it was his fault, but it's not his fault, right? You know, he made a mistake. You can't help being a rookie. Yeah, shit happened. You know, so, but the right thing to do was to get my ass over there first thing in the fucking morning, dig in and get through it. And that's what we did. And I think at the end of the day, that guy will tell that story, you know, but if he was angry and I shitted him, oh man, and especially now you got fucking Facebook, you know, you got social media. And look, it's going, not just about the clients. It's about your employees also. That I think they need to know. Yeah. I think they need to know. That. They need to know who you are, what you are and how they should treat this client. Yeah. Because and if you, he's not going to yeah. make that mistake again. That's, that's the thing I want to make sure to get back to is you talk about building relationships. Yeah. One of the things about building relationships is, that's one fewer mistake that guy's going to make. He, you know, he's going to make other ones, but right. I bet you he doesn't but make that he one. He won't make that one. Well, you know, it's funny because I've had a a, a a couple of guys that are friends of mine that come and talk to me, and one of them's a mechanic, and he was talking about it. He said, I said, man, you're too fucking hands-on. You know, and he said, well, man, i got to be there because they don't care as much as I care. And I was like, well, maybe they do care more than you think. Maybe they just fucked up. And you got to let them fuck up because that they learn, you know, you got to walk away and let them make this mistake and then, and then show them that lesson because at that point they'll never make the mistake again. Otherwise all you're doing is, is looking over their shoulder and watching them constantly. And you're not growing your business. You can't grow. Well, you might business. as well be doing it yourself. If exactly. you're just sitting there, watch somebody else do it. Yep. How the fuck are you going to get anything yeah. done? So we got a little bit of time left and, and, and we're in the middle of this crisis, the COVID-19 and whatnot. And I, uh, you know, we, you and I talked about supply chain and I know we can't get deep into it because I'm setting you up for another fucking uh, thing. Oh, I, I'm pretty confident. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty confident. My fans will come back my fans, but uh, your fans now, um, this has been fantastic. I've loved it. I think it's been a great fucking, um, uh, I don't say podcast, Zoom cast, whatever. Whatever but we're doing. We talked about um, supply chain, and you mentioned to me that you study supply chain. I don't want you to get into the supply chain, but explain to me how you, you know, I look at you as a business ethics professor, but you talked about supply chain. Explain that real quick. So, my main interest in value chains 
broadly defined is that uh, it used to be the case back in kind of the 60s where it was pretty easy to define the boundaries of IBM or General Motors or General Electric. You knew if you worked for them, you knew if you were their customer. And it seems to me, okay, so let me back up a step. I'm sitting in my office at Georgetown working on something uh, that I don't even remember now because- Because it was 20 students, years ago and you're fucking old. No, because what happened next pushed all that stuff out. Right. right. It was, uh, oh, I froze on my own screen. I wonder if I'm still live for you. Um, you're still live. You're still okay. live. Keep going. It'll pop in. Um, so, so it was a group of students and, and, and interested parties had occupied the university president's office, demanding that nothing with the university's name on it be made with sweat, sweatshop conditions. And at the time, Nike was disavowing any responsibility for their subcontracting relationships, right? Right. So look, look, we just buy stuff from, uh, in this case, Indonesia and, and to a slightly lesser extent, South Korea, right? We just buy stuff from them. Everything you need to know about your purchases is on the loading dock. Price, quality, on-time delivery, that's all you need to know. But there was a bunch of people now protesting about Nike suppliers and their treatment of their employees. And Nike says, you know, how do, well, I don't know, right? So, you know, I, I don't, who made this shirt? I don't know, right? Why do I have to know, uh, right. right? So, uh, but, but it just turns out that you do have to know because of the associational responsibility. Sure. You have to know who you, you said to me that there are certain people you won't do business with. I won't take right. money from. So now imagine that there's there's so much outsourcing and subcontracting. And I don't, again, I don't know who's listening, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are people in your office who don't work for your company but show up every day and you know are, are you know they they look an awful lot like they work for your company. The people yeah. delivering your Amazon packages. Yeah. For a while there were just Uber drivers who grabbed some Amazon business. Right. And so but but it's not like, you know, uh, an, an independent contractor working under the contract with Amazon delivered my package damaged. No, Amazon delivered my package damaged. Right. 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 So, that name, your name is tied. And so your name is tied. So this to me is just super interesting in an age of this networked economy. Right. Where where we do have to increasingly be responsible for those we are associating with. Man, we're seeing this in your business right now. The, the CPI. Right. I can't be yeah. in business with CPI if I'm the Carolina Panthers and you're talking that trash. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so look, it happens. You know, yeah. It's not like the Panthers own their own security business. Right. But they're in that value chain. They were part of right. responsible for your decisions about with whom you associate. Yep. And, and I think that's. Thing, a, and it, by the way, this the other interesting thing is. It's and not that goes to your ethics. It's not just your direct customers. Right. There was a story. Well, it's so your supplier, supplier, supplier. Yeah. Right. My, there, there's a role there. Right. McDonald's got in trouble because one of their Happy Meal toys. It was a little cars from the Pixar had lead paint somewhere on the car. It was the size of your half of your pinky nail of yellow on a yeah. little car had lead in it. Now McDonald's is on the hook. Pixar's on the hook. The suppliers yeah. on the hook. Everybody. Everybody. Right. And Everybody. So, yeah. So, so you can't just say, you know, uh, Oh, that was, you know, it, Nobody I'm just doing business. A, yeah, fuck that. A, a All right, so one thing we go ahead. We're going to wrap this thing up because I, I promise you, I know you got another podcast to do because you're a sought after guy. But this is something that has nothing to do with you. Uh, well, it's sort of the college thing, but I, you know, people are interested in um, immigration, and so I don't. I, this is not political. I swore that we'll never go political here. However. Um, you are now at the University of Toronto, which is the, and you're the York business or tell me, okay. York name University of is in the city of Toronto. So it's York Okay. University. So York University. All right. So you're at York University Business School. 
in Toronto. You're a professor. I think this is an interesting thing that people, you know, we all talk about coming over and people getting in, you know, immigration, how immigration works. Um, tell me about what it took to become, to be able to, to, to get a job there. How, how tough, because Chip, you know, Chip tried to do it as well. And it was tough. It was really tough. Um, here, it, you know, we're fighting different types of who's coming across what border here and there. And I'm not trying to get political, but, uh, you know, how tough was it for you as a professor here and the badass that you are, you would think that you could speak anywhere. So let, let, let me ask you this real quick. I'm gonna, you, you've, you've spoken as a, you've been a, a professor or, or a visiting professor in Australia. Yep. Visiting professor in China. Yep. Okay. But here, this is a full-time professorship, right? How tough was that? What were the obstacles to get to another country from here? Oh, immigration process. Look, man, um, <laughs> apropos of the supply chain conversation. Yeah. <laughs> right? I'm glad you used yeah. apropos. Wait a minute. Let me tell you something. My brother-in-law, I used apropos the other night on a Saturday drunk, and he was like, what did you say? <laughs> Yeah. I yeah. hope he's watching because French. Um, yeah. So uh, <laughs> through it, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my colleagues and I joke that anybody who says we live in a borderless world has never tried to change countries. Um, yeah. It's it's significant, and, and America makes it substantially harder than most. Right. So. So really. So, Oh, I've been through it on both ends. So, uh, so right. my, my, my beautiful partner is German. And so I've tried to get a, a German person uh, permanent residency here in America. Um, and the, the friend price was a year plus after you're married. So the detail, detail. But right, right, right. But, you know, there's so many people. Everybody thinks that America just allows people in the fucking and that's just not the case. It's no brutal. country. does. It's absolutely brutal. And, and it's much the same moving from here to Canada. It is rough. Um, it, it's not for the faint of heart. And I will spare you the the stories of trying to figure out just currency transfer alone. Uh, it, it, you know, cost me. Um, a hundred hours, give or take. Right. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, like banking and no, it, it's, it's but getting rough. over there. It's you mentioned, world. you said something to the effect that one of the ways they do, you know, so, you know, I know that here, if you, if you, you can, you, you can become American citizen over here, you pay a certain amount of money and buy a couple of businesses and, and feed back into the American economy. I have clients that do that um, by buying franchises and whatnot, sort of a, I don't know if it's a cheat around, but it's sort of a, Hey, we want you to invest before we allow you in type of stuff. And then you have the other way. So there's multiple ways to get in the country. But I, I think where I was going with this is that, you mentioned that they have a different type of battle over there where they're battling with oligarchs coming. So they're, they charge more money to buy a house or something like that. Is that, is that? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so Canada has a problem because they are so welcoming, right? It's the, uh, I want to say the second or third largest landmass uh, in the world for a country. Right. So, but, but, you know, a lot of it's largely unusable, but don't quote me on that. Um, Freezing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of the problems that they had is that uh, various I mean, it's true of America, by the way. I mean, part of the part of the big city real estate bubble is that if you want to launder money as a Russian or Chinese or Iranian oligarch, real estate in North America is a good way to push that through. And that was even before Airbnb. Uh, started really inflating and bubbling up and frothing up the uh, the real estate market. Um, so what they did in both British Columbia and Ontario is implemented a 15% non-resident tax on top of the ridiculously inflated house prices. Um, and I think they weren't trying to keep me out. I'm not real estate speculating. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was sort of collateral damage on an otherwise reasonable policy, to be honest. Um, it had a decent effect in British Columbia, um, and then 
I think before it had a chance to really do what it was supposed to do in Ontario. Uh, but look, the bottom line is you. But what did it look it. like? But what did what what is that fifteen percent? What does that look like? What are you saying? Somebody had to 15% pay fifteen percent the house price to who? To the government. And <laughs> and it and it, you got to pay. So so if I'm buying a one million dollar house in in Ontario. It's a hundred. I gotta get all right, right off the top to the government that has not a fucking thing to do with my house. It it doesn't. It it's got no, so I gotta pay that just to buy the one point five million, and I gotta put money also down on the one point five million. That is correct. Fuck. Yeah, it's 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 brutal. But Whoa. but again, no. But here and, and this is actually something that that, that I do think. Apropos of immigration, I don't think, I don't know if this is political. You'll have to let me know. I want to be the place where everybody wants to come. Yeah. Where they don't have a 15% real estate surcharge is places you don't want to live. Yeah. (laughs) Right. And so, look, if, if we're having to put all these rules in place, we must still, and, and it's we must have it back. We, we, we got a good remarkable because yeah. even with the relatively draconian kids in cages bullshit, people still want to come here. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's the same, you know. So anywhere you go, you know, who wants to go to this? And 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 I think what you, to your point is when you want to go to another country, how easy is it in other countries to get there? And to live, and and so you find a lot of people saying, "Well, it's just easy to go." And it's like, you know, I research. I would love, love to live in New Zealand, right? I mean, I just I've zero always zero really, live cases right now. Yeah, right, right. Zero. I've always wanted to go live there and hang out, but you know, I'm not a person that they really want. Not not that they don't want me, but I don't. You know, so like for you to go over to Canada. And the same thing with Chip, and I'm going to bring Chip on the show too. One of the things they had to do was vet and make sure that you, that nobody else could do what you do for you to get anybody, Anybody out there, anybody who is listening to this, if there is a foreign national in your organization, someone in your organization had to fill out a form that said that there are no Americans who can do that job. Right, right. It, it's exactly. a thing. They had to actually fill out a form that said there is literally no one in Canada as good as me. Yeah, I got and you feel a little bit good. It's kind of bullshit, but it feels. Yeah. Good. <laughs> but how long did it take them to vet that? Six months. Man, I don't even know. That's somebody else's problem. No, right. I, I, I don't. I don't have a clue what they had to do, and I don't want to know. But it took a while for you to be able to get that job because they were basically they had vetting to do something just to yeah to to because they do have uh, and this is true in a lot of countries they have uh, yeah. a a disposition toward their own yeah well listen man thank you so much dude we are we ran over a little bit seven minutes not much I mean this isn't a this isn't a damn uh, time limited thing it's just been a fun thing that I've been doing. Um, I was excited about having you. I'm confident people are going to come in. Julie, will you come say goodbye to Rob before we go? So um, I'm confident that people are going to have fun. And, and there's there's the tech. Those of you who don't know, this is my wife, the technical uh, producer. genius. Yeah, the producer. Executive uh, producer. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I did some light. I look better than I did last week with my buddy that was on here. I looked like hell. I told Julie, I said, fuck, I looked old and wrinkly. And she was like, honey, you are old and wrinkly. Yeah, no, so, and actually the tree thing in the background, it, it looks good, sort of sunset kind of thing. You're going to have to reevaluate what time of day you do this uh, after we get past June 21. But, uh, yeah, I know, man. But, I, you know, it's all new. It's all fun. And I'm in the she shed and I'm just trying to bring on some fun and, and let people hear. I have, I, I have an array of of, you know, I people tell me all the time, you got a lot of best friends. And I'm like, I know, but they really are my best friends. Like these motherfuckers are, we're that tight. You and I are together every Christmas. We're together four times a year now. And back when you were living in, in U of R, we were together six, eight times a year in some way, you know? So, 
um, thank you, man, uh, to have you here. It was a fucking honor. I think everybody enjoyed it. You were badass. We kicked ass. I hope I did well for you because I'm sure there was a, a couple of points where you were like, will he fucking listen after he asked the question? No. Nah. Hey, well, listen, bitch. I, I've, I've had conversation with you before. I know what to expect. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, fucking Dr. Robert Phillips. And and uh, we had some good questions, or one good question that came in. But anyway, uh, as this grows, I want to bring you back on with some other stuff. I know you got some shit to do. You got another podcast tonight. Tell Annika and and Hasi, I said, I love them. And, and, and I can't wait to see you guys soon. Listen, bro. Thank you so much. You 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 meant the world to me today, and I think you, I think my my fans are not my fans, but the people that watch, yep. they they're probably your fans now. Maybe I didn't run them off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you didn't. Hey, I love you, brother. I'll see All you right, soon, man. and thank you so much, man. Much love. Later, brother.